Good morning, everybody. Uh, our MPC for September is Tom Dempsey, but he couldn't be here today. You'll meet him next week. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mark Diono. Uh, you may remember him speaking to us in 2019 uh, about sports reporting. Uh, Mark is a well-known journalist in New Jersey. He grew up in Summit. You may have read his columns uh, through the years in the Star Ledger. His reporting on Hurricane Sandy made him a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And he's the author of at least five books. Uh, one of them is a testament about journalism. I, I believe three of them are about uh, the history of New Jersey. And his most recent book, I believe, is a very remarkable novel. In the last two years, uh, Mark has traveled to Ukraine uh, on missions of uh, humanitarian relief and also journalism to report to us about the human story of this terrible war. He's here today to talk us talk to us about that. So Mark, please come up and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We good? Everything's good? Okay. Um, I've been here, I think, four times and uh, over the years. And uh, I always tell the story, some of you may have heard it before. When I was a kid uh, growing up next to Memorial Field and Summit in the 1960s, uh, the old guard would have their uh, their meetings outside and uh, you know where they play darts and shuffleboard. And they always were very welcoming to like the kids that were around. And uh, I always remember that and you know, just like that, I'm old enough to join, right? <laughs> but at that point in time, they were mostly World War I veterans. And so we got to know a little bit about things that, you know, even predated our parents who were the World War II generation. And so I always remember that and uh, very fondly. And so I've never turned down an invitation uh, to come and speak to the old guard. And, um, and today, in fact, is my first day at, uh, at Rutgers to teach, and I still decided, let me get in there and talk to these guys. So, um, so I don't know how to begin this exactly, uh, because it's so weird and, and bizarre that um, I don't even kind of understand it myself. But in uh, watching the news leading up to... Um, leading up to the war in Ukraine, I kept looking at this 40 mile convoy uh, that Putin had had mustered in Belarus and 40 miles of armored vehicles. And I thought to myself, gee, from a military standpoint, that's kind of a sit and duck. And uh, it would seem to me as a veteran, I'm a Cold War veteran, um, that uh, a little muscularity in negotiations at that point could have avoided the war. And by what I mean by that is not sending troops necessarily, but the promise to send everything, to send our technology, to send our best weapons, and to have this guy consider coming to a negotiating table or risk losing what was about 50% of his military vehicles. As you know, none of that happened. Uh, and so uh, I was pretty much disgusted by that. And uh, whoops, I'm... I was I was pretty much disgusted by that. And um, I decided that when I read about the humanitarian crisis uh, uh, and this uh, this huge number of Ukrainians that were crossing into the Polish border and how they were overwhelming Poland, I decided to go. And I landed in Poland on uh, March third of two thousand and twenty two with absolutely no idea what I was gonna do. I wasn't affiliated with anybody. I had no plan. 
I only had a map that, you know, or, you know, an internet map that said where the border was. And, and so I landed in Warsaw and I drove to a town called Lublin, which is, um, which was, according to New York Times, was a big holding place for these, um, for these uh, refugees. And on my very first night there, after, you know, a long flight and a long drive, uh, in the middle of the night, there was a bus and that bus came in and it was outside my window and the drone was going on. I'm thinking, what's going on? I look out the window and they were unloading, six volunteers were unloading 40 severely handicapped people from a, uh, from a, uh, a place in Kiev. They had driven all day, stopped in Lublin. They're going to drive another day and eventually end up in a place in Belgium. And so I thought, you know, here are the most vulnerable people possible. Uh, being helped by these volunteers, and I learned very quickly uh, about the uh, about the uh, generosity of the Polish people aimed at the Ukrainians, and it was very impressive. They should have won the Nobel Peace Prize as a nation. Uh, I drove to the border of Dorusk, which is a, a very rural town on the border of uh, of Ukraine, and it's on a straight road from uh, Kiev. But both sides of the border are really rural. And and while in that little village, I found this um, Caritas tents. And I walked up and I said, I'm an American. I'm here to help. And so I spent the next few weeks unloading trucks uh, and and helping people uh, move from um, that the reception point there and driving them uh, deeper into the country and including as far as um, as far as um, Berlin. Um, this was uh, a very rural area up by the Belarusian border where I brought a woman. I uh, ended up uh, going down a farm road and 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 my little AT and T thing went off. Said, "Welcome to Belarus," uh, and I'm like, "Oh God, I, I don't need to. I don't really want to be here." So I, I turned around, and took off. And this was a typical family uh, that I I transported the, the demographic, women, their children. Uh, this one was traveling by herself with three kids. Uh, this was um, they have the, the 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 their their Costco's are called a Tesco, and the government shut them all down and opened up every one of them as refugee centers. And again, the demographic is women children, uh, people that were unable to uh, care for themselves. And there's me unloading some trucks. This is a this is a refugee center actually that's in Ukraine. Uh, and I brought a bunch of stuff there uh, with uh, some other uh, members of a, another group. And there's a couple pictures of destruction that you should see. Um, the the. In the beginning, our fear was the use of nuclear weapons. Well, the the damage is nuclear, um, and 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 vandal, it's vandalism on private homes. These are farmhouses that were blown up for no strategic reason, uh, just uh, to uh, drive people out. Uh, this is from um, the area north of Kiev. These are um, these are. Um, uh, cars that were destroyed in bombings that were about 300 of them were put in one place. Bridges blown up. Uh, these are the Russian tanks. Uh, so I first got into Kiev. I first got into Ukraine on my very first trip. And uh, that was while it was still actively being bombed. And um uh, well, I've, every time I've been there, it's been actively being bombed. But this was, you know, in the very beginning of the war. And um, the cell phones were jammed up and, and died. And, and I couldn't access any money. I couldn't use my cell phone. It was kind of scary being there. Uh, but um, th this picture is from later when they had withdrawn from uh, the area. And, uh, and I got to see some of the destruction Two of the things that I did there uh, last summer. Uh, so the shift, uh, I have, first of all, I must have a thousand pictures that I'm not going to show you all of them. So I'm kind of moving quick. Uh, 
in the very beginning, it was a humanitarian effort. And we were there, people like me that went, uh, a lot of Europeans, a lot of young people were there to get help facilitate the people leaving the country, bring supplies to them, transport them, physically transport them. And then after a while, uh, that that dried up when the Russians left uh, left the suburbs of Kiev when they withdrew. Then the next phase, when I went back for the third time, I was now working in Kiev full time at a place that was uh, in the in a museum, a shuttered museum. So so with the the government did was they they sandbagged all their monuments and they shuttered all their museums because they know the Russian MO is to destroy your language and your culture and make you Russians. And so they were afraid of these places being bombed. So I was in a folk life museum, which we had, had been turned into a warehouse. And at this stage of the war uh, last year, the military procurement was coming from the civilian community. So everybody knew somebody in the military and they would adopt that unit and, and communicate with the person in that unit. What do you guys need? And they needed everything. They needed uniforms, they needed boots, they needed gear, binoculars. Uh, we were getting uh, toy drones. And I have to tell you, the Ukrainians are really pretty amazing people. In the very first weeks of the war, these drone hobbyists took basically toy drones and wired them so they could fly over Russian tanks and drop a grenade into the hatch of the Russian tanks. So short of the weapons they needed from the West during the sanctioning period where we weren't really sending them anything, uh, the British were sending them uh, rockets, uh, handheld rockets for anti-tank rockets. But when I went back, I was doing this delivery of stuff to military as well as humanitarian aid. And uh, one of the things I did was deliver. Um, I went up the highways where the Russians came down and retreated. So I saw blown up tanks with the guns facing this way and then facing that way, you know, coming and going. Right. This one was going. And um, and uh, we would we. I delivered two of these uh, late model, I'm uh, not late model, but um, older uh, heavy duty SUVs that were paid for by uh, the uh, Ukrainian American Cultural Center in Whippany, bought in Poland or England, and then brought to Ukraine to be used by the military. So this is one of the trucks I delivered up uh, to Cherninov, which is about 60 kilometers from the Russian border. And uh, if you look here, there's a little flag on the back of the truck. And uh, I'm driving the truck with this other guy. And and we just keep getting waved all, through all the military checkpoints. You just get, get waved through. I said, how come they're waving us through? He goes, well, you have that flag. That means you're a military vehicle. I said, why didn't you guys tell me that before we started the trip? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so uh, into the summer, th I, this was one of my favorite groups of pictures and i'm leaving so much out because uh, I, I i spent so much time there and did so many different things it was really great experience one of the things that I, I really struck me though was at the site uh, saint michael's uh square the monastery uh ancient or historically ancient monastery in uh, the middle of kiev they brought um they displayed all these blown up uh burned up russian vehicles and people were playing on them, taking pictures, selfies. Kids were climbing all over them. And at first I thought, it's kind of barbaric, you know, like this little girl's climbing into a hatch where some Russian soldier was incinerated. And, you know, and, and then I really began to understand a little bit more about the history of Russia and Ukraine and 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 began to understand how deep uh, the hatred is for the Soviet mentality, and not so much the Russian people, but the Soviet mentality that they were now uh, facing again. 
there's another view of that. I, I want to show you something in this picture. I want you to look at the ground. This is a outdoor kind of festival. There's hundreds of people around here. There's the, the picture only cap captures a small piece of it. But look at the ground. Not a speck of litter. Not a cigarette butt. Not an empty plastic bottle. Not a can. And and that was one of the things that, you know, back in back in Hurricane Sandy, we had these beautiful um, pictures, not beautiful, but like these, these wonderful uh, aerial shots of all the destruction. And I would say, the story's on the ground. The, the ground is what tells you the story. The ruined wedding albums, the broken China, all those things. Well, the ground in Kiev tells you a story about their social construct and order and respect for their country. There were 350,000 displaced people in Kiev last summer who came from the suburban regions north, a uh, little bit west and east, that had lost everything. They had been bombed out, nothing. Homes just destroyed. Not one of them sleeps on the street. There are, I see more homeless people in one block in Newark than I saw traveling extensively around Ukraine, a country that's at war. And the reason is, the Ukrainians took people in to their homes and then created refugee centers and orphanages and things like that very quickly to make sure that their countrymen were taken care of. There's a lesson in that for America somewhere, but I'll leave that up to you. One of the things we did, if you look here, this is a lady uh, whose house was bombed. Um, she's now living in her barn. And you, you'll notice these are new pots and pans that we brought to her. And in any, in any humanitarian effort that we did when we brought stuff to people, and, and again, these were household necessities, because one of the things we heard everywhere we went was when the Russians withdrew, they stole everything. Toasters, jimmied out air conditioners, toilet seats, and the New York Times did an article about intercepted messages from these Ukraine, these Russian soldiers and their wives telling them, oh, if they have a toilet seat, steal it. If they have this, bring it. Because the guys that were fighting in Ukraine at this stage of the war were people from the Federation states that are basically uh, impoverished. And this is uh, one of these deliveries of uh, goods to a village. I, when I went over there, I told people um, um, I might come back with a Ukrainian wife. And if I if I could pick somebody, it would have been this lady here. Um, I'm still in touch with her, and I, I send them money from time to time. But she's a fascinating character. She's this kind of little, you know, queen of this little village called the Lips, Lipsvia. And they woke up one morning, and 200 armored vehicles were parked in the meadow across from their, started to pull into the meadow across from their house. So in a very rural area. And from this place is where the Russians bombed uh, Puchka, Puchka, Irpin, and Hostomel relentlessly. She said for for three weeks, in her words, ba-boom, 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 all, all day. But what she did was she befriended these soldiers she made them cookies and she had them come over and eat. And, and she said, you know, the, the President Zelensky told us not to antagonize them and to cooperate with them. So we did. Her husband said, we gave them our car and they put petrol in a diesel engine and they wrecked my car. That's how stupid they are. <laughs> and you can see there, I'm giving her, um, I brought her some uh, Pyrex things, cooking ware or something. Again, this is like uh, after the Russians withdrew and stole everything. That village suffered no executions, no rapes, no detainments, no, no, none of the, none of the, um, 
none of the atrocities that occurred in other places. And I think it was because of her. And, and you know, she became friendly with these soldiers, understanding, you know, they're just doing their job. They're just people, too. And we have to reach them on a human level. Uh, you've probably heard stories that the Russians, the second most powerful army in the world, uh, uh, didn't have working GPS when they invaded Ukraine. And so the Ukrainians just blacked out the road signs and they got lost. That's true. And I want to say something about that uh, to explain uh, some of why I went. Um, so I was in the Navy from 1975 to 1979. And we used to have intelligence classes. And um, and the intelligence classes were very frank and very honest. And the intelligence people told us, Russia's a paper tiger. You're going to read that they have all this stuff, you know, more nuclear subs than we have, more battleships, more aircraft carriers, more this, more that. And that's true, but none of it works. And they said to us, we, the United States of America, prop Russia up as a boogeyman so that we can sell weapons and defense systems to the rest of the world. And it's a very facetious view of the military industrial complex but knowing that much about this about the soviet union and then knowing about the brain drain of the soviet union after it fell since 1991 knowing that it's a basically an impoverished backward country how many of you run out have run out to get a Russian car or a Russian toaster or a Russian air conditioner? They don't make anything but gas and oil. Most of the people outside of the St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Western areas live in absolute poverty. They steal toilet seats. And many people are shocked to learn that there's 136 million people in Russia, one third of our population. It's a country that is dying on its own vine. And so knowing all this, I was I was so surprised that we did not approach this war with more muscularity, but sort of, again, created this boogeyman idea that, you know, they have to be feared. We have to fear them. We can't provoke Putin. Uh, we can't provoke Putin. And every time I heard those words, I wanted to puke. We, he invaded a country. What else do we need to not provoke Putin? You know, it just it just struck me. And I'm sorry if it's a little too political while there's pictures of sunflowers on the screen, but that that's the reality of it for me. And frankly, our behavior as a country since that time plays into that whole theory of the military industrial complex running the show because we're trickling out weapons, we're sending stuff in little batches, we send everything after the fact. We didn't send our Patriot missile defense till after the Russians blew up their infrastructure. We're now asking these guys to go through these heavy, heavy, heavy fortifications the Russians have put down over months with our tanks and their feet and we still haven't sent them long range missiles and we still haven't sent them F-16s. We blocked Poland from sending them 30 MiGs while that 40 mile convoy was sitting there. We stopped Poland from sending them their MiGs so that they could blow the thing up. The Ukrainians could blow the thing up. So where does this lead? It leads to an elongated war and the Ukrainians are paying for it with their blood and the destruction of their country that for all, all our fear of a nuclear war is nuclear. The destruction is, 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 is actually shocking when you see it with your own two eyes. Now, you don't have to agree with any of that, but it's my talk. So you can talk, you can, we can talk after. So uh, Ukraine is the largest producer of sunflowers in the world. 
uh, and that they have lots of use, you know, oils and stuff like that. It's a beautiful country. Uh, corn, wheat, it's 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 really a breadbasket country. And um, and I think to me, they are an interstate system away from being a top 10 world economic power. Kiev is a first rate, first world country uh, city. In Kiev, if you want to ride the subway, you take your credit card with the chip and you put it in the middle of the turnstile and it opens every little you know mom and pop kiosk has chip technology in the in the rural areas you know this idea that it's some kind of backward country you know in the rural the rural areas are the rural areas they're not much different than our rural areas but the city itself is a magnificent place a beautiful place great order so this is, but this is about this is about their ingenuity. So they protected their farm fields with everything they could throw out there to stop Russians from mining the fields. There's me uh, delivering a, a, a truck, a second truck, to Poltava, and again, um, they said, "You want to take this truck?" I said, "Sure." And they said, "It's like 400 miles," and I said, "That's okay." And they said, "Uh." You know, you got, you're going to go alone. I said, that's okay. That's fine. And, you know, the roads aren't that good. Don't worry about that. What they didn't tell me was that it was a British setup. <laughs> so the steering wheels on the on the right side of the car. <laughs> so luckily, I'm left-handed, number one. So the gear changing wasn't that difficult. And secondly, I had driven one in, uh, one in, um, in, in England a few years ago. And, and this was great because at this point in time, President Zelensky did not allow pictures of their soldiers to be taken. So anything that we published, this was published on NJ uh, Spotlight. We had to blur out their faces. So I take these guys and I said, look, we're going to take, there's a fifth guy taking the picture. And I said, let's take this picture. I said, but don't worry. If I publish the picture, your faces are going to be blurred out. And this guy here, who spoke English delivered the line of of my whole time there, and he said, "We've been fighting these guys since 2014. They know who we are." I loved it. I, I talked a little bit about the vandalism of their 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 um, their their assault, and this is basically a good example of it. The house is not destroyed, but they just blew a hole in it, basically for the hell of it. But if you look up here, it's very hard to read, but there is a woman up there working. This is in her home office. And to me, that speaks so much about their resilience. In the background here is uh, the, the air terminal at Antonov, which was home of the largest airplane ever built. Ukrainians built it under the Soviet system. So this is a very interesting place. This is the place where had the Ukrainians not put up a fight there, the war would have been over. So Antonov is a giant airport. It can land the biggest airplane in the world. It's a freight airline, a freight air airfield. So the Ukrainians, when, they, when the Russians began the invasion, the Russians began to send in attack helicopters to take over this airport. The Ukrainians responded with anybody that had a gun, anybody that could fire a gun, army reservists, regular army, cops, guys with Molotov cocktails, people that could throw bricks, anybody that could fight descended on this airport and they knocked nine Russian uh, attack helicopters out of the air and killed 300 Russian paratroopers. The Russians withdrew and the Ukrainians destroyed the airport. The Russians came back and they said, okay, you guys take it, <laughs> you can't use it. And because of that, Russia could not transport in their heavy equipment and they had to drive down the street from Belarus and Russia. And that's when the Ukrainians were able to repel some of those attacks, but keep them out of Kiev itself. What I love about this picture, this picture was taken in uh, July 
for June of uh, 2022, two months after the Russians withdrew. This is a brand new garden. I, I get choked up when I talk about this. And this is a brand new children's playground that the Ukrainians built as a act of complete defiance and resilience. You can blow up our town, but we have a future here. We're going to beautify what's left of our town, and we're going to create a playground for our children. And I just thought that the courage of that, the mentality of that is just so amazing. Um, because of because of my nature as a journalist, and the fact that I'm generally a, a likable person, except for the except to the women that I marry, um, I, I was able to I was able to get into um, these very interesting places. And this was a this was a place that was built by the Soviet Union. It's an office building, a, a, a government building in, in Kiev. And if you look at the width of the cement of this door and the door handles, this was built by the Russians to protect them from a nuclear attack by us. And now the Ukrainians were using it to protect, to hide from Russian bombings. And it, it's a, it's a, a a government office, a procurement office, and these are stacks of paper that people came and slept on as mattresses while they while Kiev was being under siege uh, in the beginning of the war, and they smartly kept stuff in there in case they came back, and they did, or tried to. I wrote uh, a thing on my Facebook page um, that. Uh, it was really, I think, one of my, one of my best view, views of the whole story, and that's that the backbone of this war are the women that are home. And so in this museum that I worked, every day, 18 hours a day, this group of women would come down and they hand-weaved all the camouflage used by the Ukrainian soldiers, not just them, obviously, but in every place where people collected stuff, and I said all the procurement came from the civilians, in every place where stuff was collected, they had women, elderly, children, anybody that could use their fingers, making camouflage for the soldiers. And these women were in this place 18 hours a day. Many of them came after their regular jobs and did all that. So at last... Uh, last uh, summer, I also had the ability uh, to go to some really interesting, crazy places. And this was a camp above uh, Chernobyl, uh, which was a, a former children's, uh, Soviet children's camp. But that's, that's another place. And this, this, these guys here are, were a motor, a motor um, unit that was at the front and now withdrawn for, you know, rest and relaxation. And this is how they live. This is how these soldiers lived last year because they had no air support. They had no forts. They trained and they lived in these remote, in these remote um, uh, farming villages, some of them, some of which had been destroyed. And they, you peeled their own potatoes, they cooked their own food, they did their own laundry, they worked on their vehicles, they did whatever training they could, uh, you know, and they lived in these spread out areas where there would be, you know, seven of them to a house here and seven of them to a house over there. And when we went up there, your cell phones had to come off because they didn't want the Russians tracking where the collection of uh, cell phones would be. Uh, because they were afraid of being bombed. And again, at this point in the war, this is last summer, um, they they had no uh, Patriot air defense. They had no air defense uh, except whatever they could throw up themselves. And we brought food and stuff and up there. And, and this is another place. Um, this was also last summer. 
this is towards the end of my stay um, last summer. And um, these are guys also staying in this remote area. This is an artillery unit. And um, we were uh, three kilometers from Belarus. So when they were not fighting actively in the war, they were now protecting that border in case there was more people coming. And again, this is just how they lived. And there's me having dinner with them. And um, uh, this guy here with the beard, uh, we were standing outside and I, I've i never seen anything like it. The sky was, uh, there were more, there were more stars and there were black spaces in between them. I've never seen anything like it. The sky was actually, the starlight actually lit up the ground. And as we're looking up at the sky, he's smoking a cigarette. I kind of wanted one from him, but I quit 20 years ago. And um, we see these things moving around very uh, weirdly and sporadically. And he points up and he says, Elon Musk. So the sky was so clear, you could actually see the Starlink satellites with your naked eye. So these guys too, some of these guys were like serious guys. Like, you know, one of, one of the things that the Ukrainians did was when the war began, they, re they, they brought in all their veterans that were able to fight. They started with guys who had actually served in the Soviet army. So they would understand the Soviet mentality, the Red Army, because Ukrainians were still in the Red Army even after it gained independence because they had signed up and they were lifers or whatever. This guy here with the mustache was one of those guys. Anyway, so I'm with these guys and we're having dinner and I said to them, don't worry, when we publish the picture, we'll black out your faces. And they said, no, don't worry about that. Just black out the beer because we're not allowed to be drinking. <laughs> Uh, so this is just some more pictures from that time, um, how they did laundry, the stuff we brought. Now, this is winter time. And I went back in the winter and I met, uh, this is in Lviv, and I picked up a bunch of stuff in Poland and brought it in a rental car uh, to uh, a guy that I met in Lviv. Again, the procurement came from their civilian population. So he was going to bring the stuff to uh, other guys i had went into uh i raised money and i went to uh every polish department store i could find and i bought as much long underwear and warm weather gear as i could and i delivered it to him while i was there in the winter i met this guy uh you know which interesting in the networking of all this um you know you get to meet all these different people that are doing things over there there's a lot of us over there and I met this guy who's an American combat medic, and he was running uh, he was running tourniquet training courses. Uh, and so I joined with them. And then when I went back uh, last summer, I'm sorry, when I back went back this summer, we did more work. Um, I'll get to that. Uh, in one of the procurement things in the warehouse that I was working in, one of the things that they had to uh, deliver and raise money for were body bags. And this is a stack of body bags that uh, speak to the reality of the war. How are we doing for time, guys? Good? Okay. So one other thing I did was, uh, again, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian wherewithal and the women. I'm buying long underwear in Poland. They are making it out of uh, wholesale fleece. And so I helped finance some rolls of that fleece and these women would go in the basement and they would make this this under thermal wear for these soldiers by size the guys would send them their measurements and they would make it to fit them because they knew people in the unit and, and again this is speaks to their their desire and their procurement this is this is on january 6th which is their christmas and this woman who is about to perform at a traditional folk thing spends a few hours first packing first aid kits before her performance. Okay, now I'm fast forwarding to uh, this year. Um, and if anybody doubts my, if anybody doubts my dedication to this cause, I let young medics uh, start IVs on me for practice 
so they would know how to do it in the field. And uh, this is a delivery of uh, stuff uh, that we brought to um, the first line of defense on the Dnipro River, which was not the front, but would be the front if the front fell. And the Russians were um, the Russians were uh, three kilometers away from where I was on the other side of the D Dnipro River. Uh, this is um, 90, 90 kilometers northeast of Kharkiv and uh, right above where they bombed the dam later. I, I wasn't there when that happened. It happened later. This was formerly Russian-occupied territory. And even though the Russians had occupied this, the destruction was like this everywhere. It's, it's not just because they were there. And I just love this picture, you know, Life has to be back to normal in some fashion. So the woman is coming home from the grocery store on her bike. You know, uh, there's me driving a truck. There's me. Uh, There's a 50 caliber machine gun on the back of that uh, that that Jeep or that SUV and, and the netting to protect us from uh, uh, shrapnel or whatever. Uh, they said, OK, uh, look, when we tell you, you got to put that stuff on. <laughs> You know, you know, right now it's okay, but when you tell you, we'll take this stuff, the gun, and you put that stuff on. So I was there for a couple of days, and that, that was, it was great. And uh, one of the things, um, in terms of procurement, now the Ukrainians are actually making stuff that they need, and it's being procured through uh, through military channels, which, of course, slows everything down. So... I helped uh, finance uh, the delivery of some tourniquets through this group at the museum and then uh, did some tourniquet training separate from that with this combat medic that I had met the year before. So there's me, uh, and it is just amazing the difference in the year. So in the first year that I was there, last summer, they had no forts, as I said, they had no training camps because of the fear of Russians bomb, Russian bombing. So now this summer, when I went back in May, they have uniforms. This is an artillery unit. They all wear the same uniform. We were at a training camp. There's 3,000 soldiers there. We went in uh, to help uh, help them, not all of them, but uh, we several hundred uh, we trained on tourniquet use. There's me cooking. And this is, you know, some of the, we were doing training with heavy artillery and uh, things like that. This is outside of, um, this is outside of uh, Kiev. And again, it's, it's one of these things where the, you know, the women involved, you know, this woman owned this cafe, they bombed it out. And now she is trying to create a trauma center for children. And uh, I went there and, you know, as an American, they wanted me to see everything that was was going on. That that's pretty much the slideshow. It's 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 if I had five hours, I could I could give you a lot more. Uh, but I I know we have to be cognizant of the time um, in all. So, um, in all. Ugh. In all, I spent uh, five months of the uh, of the war there. Uh, very fortunate that uh, my job in the city of Newark, uh, where I work for Raz Baraka now, um, has been very very supportive. They have uh, they have uh, been allowed me to go, and um, and you know just as long as I'm in touch and they know how to get me. Uh, they can uh, find me, and I do work for them over there while I'm over there. Um, the cemeteries are uh, very interesting places. They have uh, the flags indicate someone is a dead, died in the war, and the the flowers are uh, are really uh, just overwhelming in terms of their beauty, and uh, they have pictures, and a lot of the gravestones they have just they, they're carved or, it, you know, with the picture of the person. 
the dead soldier in in his soldier garb and gear. It's really kind of interesting. I I can't say enough about these people, and and I think that you know coming out of our country now and seeing the political polarization and and the forced the the forced political polarization i said to somebody earlier uh here i was in the media for 40 years and i left uh with the belief that it is the single most destructive force in our country right now and i don't want to be involved in it anymore but you know all of the things that pull us apart you know to go there and see people that are united whether there's people there that don't like Zelensky there's people there my landlady over there I've, I've, I go to the same place she liked being in the Soviet Union she's a contemporary I had a happy childhood with the Soviet Union it was it's harder now than it was with the Soviet Union nonetheless everybody is rowing in the same direction that woman is housing me un people and others to help in in the in the war right so so not everybody digs in and they have this great national unity and this tremendous appreciation of their freedom and, and i found this to be true of eastern europe eastern europe and at first i thought it was maybe a holdover from the soviet mentality it's a very orderly place. It's very clean. It's it's very, very orderly. The social constructs, there is a way to behave. You know, when the, when, when the red hand's up, everybody stands on the curb. It doesn't matter if any cars are coming. They stand there. When it turns green, they all walk across the street. If you walk across the street, they'll, they'll yell at you. You know? So there's this social construct that... I at first thought was maybe a holdover from Soviet days, respect for law, respect for the cops. Cops can be kind of brutal over there too, but I shouldn't say too. They they can be. Um, and then I realized that's not a holdover from the Soviet Union. They know something that we've forgotten, and that is freedom comes for freedom to work in a society there has to be self-governed restraint and responsibility and when you lose that we become prisoners of everybody's freedom and everybody's individual rights and, and i'll leave you with that before we take any questions uh because i think that's an important thing for us to remember that we are on a very slippery slope of putting individual rights and individual opinions and individuality above the social construct of the country. And so our cities are chaotic compared to a city of 3 million people where 10% don't have a home. Any questions? And you're first, uh, say your name and then ask your brief question. Okay, Mark, right here. Alan Hamilton, thanks for your presentation. I got it, Mark. I got it. Thanks for your presentation. Excellent. Excellent. So I have a question about the end game. They've been at it for about two years, and I appreciate you have a sense of all this tactical on the ground stuff. But uh, there has to be an end to all of this. Do you have a sense of how this is going to end? Uh, I, for example, heard interviews with um, Russians and Ukrainians, and they said it's not going to end until Putin dies. But in any case, what's your sense of the end game? That that's a great question, and I can tell you uh, something very interesting uh, that we'll talk about why the end game is so difficult. When the war began there might have been some wiggle room for uh some negotiation and then the atrocities were uncovered the mass graves the executions the rapes you know the horror stories i have uh i there's things that i know i won't even tell you 
that are just so disgusting uh, I, it's not really fit for an audience of what's happened to children over there firsthand accounts last summer when i was there i'm sorry in the in the in the spring when i was there before the, those atrocities began to become very well known. They have all these historic sites, you know, like the Holomador site and this other place where there's a uh, hundred thousand dissidents buried, and tourist sites, right? This summer, those places were packed. The Russians ripped the scab off of all those ancient atrocities. And so the Ukrainians now are completely dug in. They are never going to give up. If there's a negotiated peace and they give up land, they'll be assassinating governors, blowing up cars, killing Russians until another war starts. So I think the end game to me is dealing with Putin the way we dealt with Hitler, a total and absolute defeat. And if we don't get there, we're going to put a country into some semblance of civil war for the foreseeable future because you can't trust the russians you know we we signed an agreement when ukrainian ukraine had the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world after us and we asked them to give it back to russia so they could become a non-nuclear state we they did under the promise that we would protect them if Moscow invaded and under the promise that Moscow would never invade. And now here we are. So Mark, thank you so much for coming. This is an incredibly moving story. And thank you for coming here multiple times. And thank you for doing all this work that you did over there and then bringing it back to us here. We see it in the news, but it's so much more moving when we hear you do it. So thank you. I hope you will seriously consider becoming a member of Old Guard. But I actually do <laughs> I do have a question for you. And it's not about the end game, but it's about the beginning game. I'm always amazed by the contrast between what happened in Crimea and what's happening now. And the Russians rolled in there and... I don't think a shot was fired. And, and the Ukrainians somehow woke up between then and now. So could you speak to that? Well, in uh, 2014, when the Russians annexed Crimea uh, and, um, and began to uh, uh, support Russian separatists in, in the Donbass territory, uh, basically, the rest of the world was asleep. And I think um, the famous quote by uh, President Obama was, this is not your father's foreign policy. Like, we don't really worry about Russia too much. And uh, so here we are. Um, one of the things that I find most disturbing about our, our lack of commitment here is that... Um, The Ukrainians blew up eight airplanes on the um, Crimean Peninsula that were one half of the Black Sea fleet's aircraft. We have 174 war aircraft in the sixth fleet in Naples, six of seven fleets. In 1832, the, US, the, the, the United States being a island nation realized that the its its navy must protect international shipping uh lanes and we had a war with the barbary pirates in 1832 and now we've just let this guy blockade this grain while we have all this superior naval power and we're letting it go on and on and on i don't know if it's that Ukraine woke up to your question, Paul, or that the 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 invasion of Kiev became so heinous that the world couldn't really abide by it uh, to some extent, because prior to that, 
you know, Crimea had been part of Russia up until the 1950s. To give it back to Russia or to Russia, take it, they ceded it to Ukraine. For them to take it back, maybe not such a big deal. In the Donbass region, on the border, people live back and forth. There is some sense that, you know, there's shared heritage, shared language. Most people in the east of Ukraine do speak Russian. That's how they've grown up. That's how they were educated. Um, Ukrainian as a language is is not really spoken in 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 outside of the western more urban areas of the country right so i think the 40 mile convoy and the threats that we are going to invade this place is really what woke everybody up up until that time it was sort of like eh, it's just a little you know a little territorial dispute online miguel uh, yes, I want to thank you for your presentation, and I agree with um, everything you've said. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, because uh, I'm on my earphones. Um, just one thing, when, when the Russians came in in 2014, the Ukrainian administration uh, was pro-Russia. It was the guy that they drove out before Putin was elected. So they, they basically had an invitation to come in. Now, Russia says that they speak Ukrainian. Well, I grew up in the Lower East Side. There's a lot of people that speak Russian in the Lower East Side, and Russia is not trying to annex the Lower East Side. <coughs> um, but I also agree with what you said about giving the weapons slow. I mean, we have over 100 A-10 warthogs, which are designed for bunker and uh, busting that are sitting there that we're not going to use because they're for us obsolete but they could be gold in the hands of the ukrainian pilots and they're not that hard to fly they're not f-16s the f-16s i understand need you know support and mm -hmm. logistics to go with it so i i really appreciate the uh, you, your views i agree with everything you said i just wanted to point out that thing about uh the ukrainian uh, president your question please I well, I, I want it, it was, was a, a, a government. Uh, why did you know that the Ukrainian president was pro Russian before Zelensky? And they had I guess if I have to make it a question, government. I'll make it a question. Uh, Ken Lindhorst, and thank you again for an excellent presentation. I basically agree with all you said, and particularly with uh, too little, too late with regard to military support. This may be more of a comment, but I'd like you to reflect on it. Um, to wage a war, the fundamental foundation is the economy, to be able to be able to do it. If you look at Russia, it's the 11th largest economy in the world, which places it behind the GDP of Texas. Um, how long, I mean, they talk about a stalemate lasting forever, but I wonder if the United States is not waiting for the um, the Russian economy to collapse like Reagan did with the Soviet Union. Well, I think that's fine and good if you're not a Ukrainian, you know. I mean, this is one of the things that I find, you know, particularly galling about it is that, yeah, there's great policy. We can outlast them. We can do all these things. They're the ones dying. They're the ones whose country is being absolutely just devastated. And I, you know, I mean, I'm not naive. I know that there's going to be money to be made uh, rebuilding their country. There's going to be there's going to be money in, in weaponizing them moving forward. Um, Russia's economy is certainly going to sag. It's been sagging before the war. Um, you're right about their GNP. You know, their GN, they're not even a top 10, uh, their GNP is not even top 10 in the world. Worse than that is their logistics standing in the world. They're like the 160th ranked country in terms of logistics. There's like island nations in the Pacific that have better logistics systems than the Russians. Um, one of the very interesting things about this war is um, I, I learned over there that 
Ukraine, for much, for to a large extent, Ukraine was the brains of the operation. You know, that the Ukrainian people were the inventors. The Ukrainian soldiers are the ones who expelled the Nazis. You know, the, the great Soviet victory over Russia, uh, over the Nazis, happened in Ukraine. I mean, they, 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 they got into Moscow and they lost the battle there and Volkarov lost the battle there. Volkarov's 100 miles from Ukraine and or 100 kilometers from Ukraine. Most of the fighting was done in Ukraine. The Ukrainian, um, the the Ukrainian population is forty four million. Russia's one hundred and thirty six million. the The population of ethnic Russians, Eastern Slavic people, is declining through birth rates and and mass migration of people just wanting to get out of there that can. Meanwhile, the Turkic and Asiatic Federation state populations are rising so what they want is those 44 million ukrainians to be brought back into their eastern slavic population the ukrainians make a joke they don't really want our land they want our women well that's understandable they're the most beautiful women in the world in my opinion but what they're really saying is they want to they want to take our women so that they can build up the population of Russians, of Eastern Slavic people. The fascinating thing about this history is that Eastern Slavic civilization started in Kiev. It was called the Kievan Rus, and it spread up into Belarus, north into Belarus, south and then east into Russia. Moscow only became the center of the, the Rus when the trade routes for the Baltic opened up like 400 years later or 300 years later. So in a historic sense, Russia belongs to Ukraine, not the other way around. And it's true. Where I was staying in, in, uh, where I was staying in Kiev is next to this gigantic monastery that was the founding cave monastery of the Russian Orthodox Church, of the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church. So Kiev was the beginning of, of the Russian civilization, which is, is really kind of a fascinating historic fact. One line, John Makeda. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, my question is, what do you see happening after Putin is gone? Uh, the reason I'm trying to find some parallels between what's going on now and the Second World War. At the end of Second World War, basically Germany lost. Hitler was gone. Uh, in, in this case, there will be no clear cut winners and losers. In other words, Russia is not going to lose the war. There's going to be some kind of stalemate or uh, perhaps a peace agreement. The reason I'm asking this, Ukraine will need to be rebuilt and it will be very expensive. What do you see? How do you see possibility that Russia will pay reparations to Ukraine for what they have done? Russia making reparations? I, I don't see that at all. I, I, I see that uh, the West will come in and um, and do, do their best to build it. Uh, to, to be honest with you, put Russia aside for a minute. Um, because I'm not an expert on any of this. I'm just a newspaper guy. But from my, my observation, this country, our country, would be very, very smart to invest as heavily as we could into Eastern Europe. Poland and Ukraine are remarkable countries with, with great futures of economic growth. They both have the secret weapon, food. And, uh, and you know... Um, and they love they love the things that we supposedly stand for. You know, this is very interesting. Again, you learn all these crazy things that like I didn't know before, right? So I land in uh, Krakow. I was going to rent a car when one of my trips. I rented a car and drove over. I, I get I get into Ukraine two ways. I either fly to Warsaw and take a train into Kiev. The overnight train takes thirteen hours. The scenic route's 18 hours on the train. 
or I fly into Krakow via Geneva and Vienna, Krakow, and I rent a car and I drive in, right? So I was in Krakow in a cab, or was it Warsaw? I forget, either place. It was, and it was on their Independence Day. So there's a parade going down the street. And the guy, the cab driver, you know, he's, we're talking, and he speaks English, we're talking about the thing. And he says to me, <clears throat> it's our Constitution Day, Constitution Day. He says to me, you know, we are the second oldest democracy in the world after you. And I said, really? I didn't know that. He goes, yeah, we ratified our Constitution in 1791. And you did yours in, in 1789. And it just hit me like all of a sudden, here's this country that was the second oldest democracy in the world. And after World War II, we just gave it to Russia. Here, you guys take it. The second oldest democracy in the world. And we just threw them to the wolves. And so I think, you know, as a democratic world, we owe Eastern Europe a chance to be like us because they have that desire for that freedom. They are ancient countries that have been, have overthrown monarchies and done all that stuff. And, you know, the Ukrainians have been fighting Russia, Russia aggression for hundreds of years, well, probably 200 years. And it continues you know, they're also the first Soviet state. Russia took them over in 1921. And they fought them and fought them and fought them and fought them. So I think it would be very wise for us to uh, to really uh, to really invest in those countries and what they stand for. Thank you. Uh, this presentation was. Uh, this was very moving and uh, I think very motivating too. Uh, so we'd like to thank you for being the eyewitness who came to us and explained it. Uh, we like to thank our speakers with a certificate. And I think you've heard the story <laughs> before that the Old Guard was founded when Summit was the orchid capital of right. this region. Right. So hence our logo. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming to us again. Um, and now I'd like to call for the Old Guard salute. Thanks a lot.